McDonald's is the largest restaurant chain in the world, with over 40,000 restaurants spread over 120 countries. By this point, the Golden Arches are an inescapable sight wherever you go, and McDonald's has sold well over 300 billion hamburgers. But the original McDonald brothers who started the business had their company all but stolen from them. Because what began as a single drive-in restaurant was soon transformed into a global fast food empire because of an unrelenting milkshake machine salesman. And even though it may appear to be a simple burger business from the outside, McDonald's secretly dominates an entirely different industry completely unrelated to selling fast food. At times, McDonald's is an inspiring story of an entrepreneur defying all the odds and building an empire. But at the same time, it's a story of betrayal, fraud, and countless scandals. At one point, McDonald's even came face to face with the Italian Mafia. Honestly, this is a crazy story. So sit back and relax as we journey through the insane history of McDonald's. In the early 1900s, the American landscape was undergoing a massive transformation. The Ford Motor Company perfected the mass production of the car, and all across the country, roads were being paved to make way for it. But the introduction of the car did more than change the way Americans traveled. It also changed the way they ate. In sunny California, hundreds of drive-in restaurants were popping up, and customers loved the experience. You would drive into the parking lot and be greeted by a waitress at your window. A few minutes later, your order would be delivered right there. You didn't even have to get out the car. To spice things up, some restaurants even had waitresses deliver food on roller skates. That was the world that the young Richard and Maurice McDonald encountered when they left New Hampshire and moved to California in 1927. But to begin with, the two brothers, Richard and Maurice, or Mac as he was otherwise known, didn't even think about restaurants. They wanted to start a career in the movie business, and so they got jobs pushing film equipment and handling props on movie sets, saving up with the hope of someday buying their own movie theatre. When the Great Depression struck, Richard and Mac carefully watched every penny they earned, and five years later, they bought the cheapest theatre they could find. Unfortunately, they got what they paid for, and their rundown theatre earned them barely enough to survive. So after five years of struggling to turn a profit with their theatre, the brothers decided it was time to abandon the movie business and pursue something more lucrative. Everywhere they looked, the McDonald brothers saw new drive-in restaurants popping up, and so they figured there has to be money to be made here. Their first restaurant was called McDonald's Barbecue, and originally they sold hot dogs. It was a tough challenge. Between learning how to work a grill, take and deliver orders, and manage a restaurant staff, they had a lot on their hands. But after two hard years of running their restaurant, they were finally ready for something bigger. They set up a new shop in an octagonal building on a parking lot in San Bernardino. It was bigger, in a better location, and with new items on the menu. On weekends, the new McDonald's barbecue attracted over 100 cars at a time, and the brothers managed a staff of 20 waitresses while they rushed to make milkshakes and cocot dogs, ribs, pork sandwiches, and burgers. Their cash registers were soon flooded with money. By 1948, the brothers had made enough to live in a mansion, so their competitors were completely stunned when they did the unthinkable and abruptly closed everything down. Richard and Mac had the best restaurant in town, but the current operation was driving them crazy. Firstly, their restaurant had become San Bernardino's local teenage hangout spot, and was frequently filled with leather jacket wearing customers that brought just as much trouble as they did business. Secondly, it demanded too much of their time and energy in the kitchen and was extremely stressful to run. And finally, finding qualified cooks was hard and expensive. And so from the outside, it looked like the McDonald brothers were just giving up. But behind closed doors, they were devising a new plan to completely transform their restaurant. You see, when they looked over their receipts from the last year, the brothers found that 80% of their revenue was generated exclusively from hamburgers. So they went with their gut and cut their menu down to only the essential. A hamburger, cheeseburger, french fries, milkshakes, and Coca-Cola. They then obsessed over reinventing the process of making a hamburger. The brothers traced the outline of their store on their home tennis court and experimented with different layouts, measuring and timing every step carefully. Carefully. When they were done, every step of the burger making process had been streamlined. For example, instead of having waitresses to serve customers in their cars, customers would order at the window. Another example was having everyone in the kitchen handle only one task. 
whether it was working the grill, cooking the fries, packaging the burgers, or taking orders. This meant they didn't need skilled workers to produce quality food. And since they only sold burgers now, they could make the food before an order was even placed, so orders got fulfilled in around 15 seconds. They called their new approach the speedy service system. And it produced delicious hamburgers with the same efficiency that Henry Ford's factories produced cars. This kind of assembly line style production was a whole new approach to the restaurant business, but it meant that their restaurant was cleaner, less hectic, and less expensive. It also meant that Richard and Matt could sit back from their office and watch the system work its magic. However, when they reopened McDonald's, the speedy service system did cause some confusion. Customers would sometimes just sit in their car expecting a waiter to come serve them, as the notion of going up to order yourself was totally new. But once everyone realized how the new process worked, and that they could get their orders within 15 seconds, they were hooked. The McDonald brothers had redefined fast food, and word of it was spreading in the industry. To their competitors' surprise, Richard and Mac were happy to spill the system's secrets, and they invited anyone in for a full tour of the kitchen for free. Some of the biggest fast food franchises today, like Burger King and Taco Bell, got their start by shamelessly copying the speedy service system. But by 1954, Richard and Mac McDonald were serving more burgers, fries and milkshakes than they ever dreamed possible, and it wasn't too much work. They lived a simple, rewarding life working together in California. But little did they know, everything was about to change for McDonald's. It's time to introduce the real protagonist of the McDonald's story, Ray Kroc. Despite coming from very humble beginnings, Ray had a lot of ambition even as a young kid. Whilst his mother was at home giving piano lessons to help out with the finances, she ordered him to help out with regular housework. But she never caught Ray complaining. Instead, Ray took pride in making beds, sweeping the floor, and scrubbing the furniture until it shined. In his spare time, he was taught to play the piano, and with unwavering discipline, he mastered it from an early age. But when he was 15, the United States joined World War I, and Ray couldn't bear sitting at home as his fellow countrymen risked their lives. So he lied about his age, managed to get deployed as an ambulance driver for the Red Cross. By sheer coincidence, he worked right alongside Walt Disney. When Ray returned home, he was still in high school, but he'd had enough. Not six months later, his parents couldn't do much to stop him from dropping out. He was determined to make it out on his own as a piano player, so he took to the streets to make a living by his talents. When he was 20, Ray went against his parents' wishes again and got married. He understood that this was a big responsibility though, and he had to take care of his wife Ethel. So for the first time in his life, he decided to get a stable job. He found it at the Lily Cup Company, where he sold paper cups. Since he was energetic and charismatic, Ray took naturally to sales. By day, he scoured the state chasing leads, and by night he still played the piano for a radio station. When he finally made it home, he fell into bed exhausted. Ethel did soon become frustrated by the limited time Ray had to spend with her though, and when she told Ray she was pregnant, he knew he had to rethink his strategy. The piano got him paid, but it would never be enough to support his family. Instead, he cultivated his ability as a salesman. And luckily for him, that was the right choice. Because of prohibition, hotels and bars began serving ice cream since they weren't allowed to sell liquor, and thus American food service businesses bought paper cups like crazy. Ray even found ways for companies to sell more of the products that used his paper cups. It was win-win. His clients got more revenue, and he made more cup sales. But in October 1929, the stock market crashed, unleashing the Great Depression, and the growing economy of the United States came to a sudden stop. Ray's boss at Lily Cup sat him down in his office and told Ray that he would have to take a pay cut. Ray's face turned red. I can't accept that, he said. But as Ray heard his boss explain to him that he didn't have an alternative, Ray said to hell with it, and quit right on the spot. But when his wife Ethel found out, she felt Ray was betraying her and their newborn baby by quitting a stable job when they were in desperate need of money. So Ray went pleading to get his old job back, but his relationship to his boss was tainted forever. When he returned to his job, one of his customers had invented a new milkshake machine he called the Multi-Mixer, allowing for five milkshakes to be made at once. When Ray tasted the delicious new milkshakes it made, he saw an opportunity. If Lily Cups sold the Multi-Mixer as well, they would automatically sell more paper cups as the products went together perfectly. However, when Ray proposed the idea to his boss, he ridiculed him, saying a paper cup company shouldn't be selling milkshake machines. This time, Ray had really had enough, and quit once again. He decided to start his own sales company to sell the multi-mixer instead, and he wasted no time getting started. He was up against a tough economy with a family to feed, and had to make money fast. 
Despite enormous adversities, Ray worked 14 hour days and entertained potential clients late into the night. With a relentless work ethic and a good product, he was soon driving all around the country selling thousands of multi-mixers per year and making a decent living. But just as soon as his efforts began to pay off, America was thrust into World War II. Because of the war, most factories shifted their focus to supplying the army and multi-mixers weren't getting made anymore. Ray was living his worst nightmare. He was a salesman without a product. To survive, he tried selling a bunch of different products until the Allies declared victory in 1945. But once the war ended, the market finally took a positive turn for Ray. With the baby boom following the war, ice creams became all the rage, and so did multi-mixers. Ray began selling them to the biggest franchises in America, such as Dairy Queen. However, this boom also meant that by the 1950s, newer and better products were entering the market, and the multi-mixer was falling out of fashion. If Ray didn't find a winning product soon, he could be in serious financial trouble. But he then noticed something odd in his records. Surely it was a mistake. A tiny restaurant in a remote town 60 miles east of LA had ordered a grand total of eight multi-mixers. Restaurants rarely bought more than one. What on earth would they need eight for? Ray's curiosity was too much for him to handle. He had to see for himself. So he took a trip to San Bernardino, California. Ray arrived early in the morning. But at first glance, he was not impressed with McDonald's. But very quickly, the parking lot began to get busier and busier. Probably 150 people showed up. When Ray paid 15 cents for a hamburger and received it almost instantly, he couldn't believe it. Everything was clean, his burger was delicious, new customers came in every minute, and it was a family environment. Ray had never seen anything like it. He introduced himself to the McDonald brothers and they told him all about the operation. Ray immediately loved their speedy service system and he finally understood why they needed eight multi-mixers to operate. This was the most active and most efficient fast food operation he'd seen in his whole career. The brothers also told Ray that they were looking for a franchising agent, someone to build more McDonald's restaurants like this across the country and find operators to run them. The McDonald's brothers enjoyed their simple life running this one store, and so they didn't want to do it themselves. But Ray knew that if more McDonald's restaurants like this one did open, they would also need a lot more multi-mixers. So he told the brothers to call him if they found someone to help them with franchising McDonald's. However, for the next week, Ray had trouble sleeping. His imagination ran wild, as he was tormented by a vision of McDonald's potential. When he sold a multi-mixer, his client used the same one for 10 years. But McDonald's sold hamburgers to thousands of people every day. He knew he somehow had to get involved in this. He called Richard McDonald to ask if they'd found a franchising agent by now. They hadn't. So Ray asked, well, what about me? When Ray began franchising McDonald's in 1955, he was 52 years old. He had diabetes, arthritis, and had lost both his gallbladder and thyroid gland. And still, he worked with the same enthusiasm he had when he was only 18. Having struck a deal with the McDonald brothers to help them franchise, Ray was on a mission to put a McDonald's in every corner of America. And so he founded McDonald's System Incorporated, a separate entity to the original restaurant that was run by the McDonald brothers. The contract with the McDonald brothers stated that Ray's job was to scout new locations to open new McDonald's stores and to find restaurant operators to run them. Ray would then train them on how to use the speedy service system and repeat the process with more stores all across the country. The contract also stated that if Ray wanted to make any changes in the store's design or change any part of the speedy service system, he would need to receive written confirmation signed by both brothers. Now, for every new McDonald's restaurant Ray opened, he received $950 up front, and the store operator would pay him 1.9% of the revenue the store generated. However, of that 1.9%, over a quarter would go to the McDonald brothers as a royalty payment. So Ray was essentially getting 1.4% of the money each McDonald's store made. And at first, Ray was thrilled about this partnership soon he would start to feel he'd got a very bad deal, and that his relationship with the McDonald brothers would be much worse than he could have imagined. It all began when Ray found a great new spot for his first store near his office in Des Plaines, Illinois, and he also found a great new operator to run it. The McDonald brothers gave Ray a new design featuring two golden arches for the new store, but the design didn't include a basement, which was absolutely needed for the store to function properly. Richard and Mac both agreed Ray should build the basement but they refused to sign anything, which the contract clearly stated was required before Ray could proceed. Since it was necessary, Ray went ahead and built the basement anyway, but this meant he was in breach of the contract, and thus the brothers could technically sue him at any time. Once the store opened though, the Golden Arches became a local attraction. 
Ray arrived at the store every morning to check that everything was ready. He would then drive to work at his sales company, which he still owned, and return every night to clean up any cups or wrappers in the parking lot. It wasn't his job to do that, of course, but Ray made sure that the quality, service, and cleanliness in the restaurant was held to his personal standards. In just a few months, the McDonald's in Illinois was even more impressive than the original McDonald's operated by the McDonald brothers. Still, Ray's company, McDonald's System Incorporated, only got $950 for it, plus 1.4% of the store's revenue. So whilst the store's operator was getting rich, Ray himself was barely making any money considering all the work he was putting in. But it soon paid off in another way. The store was so impressive that Harry Sonborn, the vice president of an ice cream chain called Tasty Freeze, decided to suddenly quit his prestigious job and come to work for Ray. Tasty Freeze was one of the largest franchises in the country at this point. However, Ray only had enough money to pay Harry $100 a week, less than a quarter of his salary at Tasty Freeze. Surprisingly though, Harry was so keen on being a part of McDonald's that he accepted. Harry's job would be to manage the finances of McDonald's System Incorporated, including negotiating loans and devising a way for them to actually make a profit. Harry had a lot of experience from Tasty Freeze, so in 1959, Ray appointed him as CEO. This way, Ray could focus on building as many stores as he could without worrying about the financial side of the business, something that totally disinterested him. In in their first year as a duo, they got 18 franchisees signed up to run their own McDonald's store, nine of them in California. However, although it was easy to find new operators there, it turned out to be incredibly difficult to control them from halfway across America. The first few operators didn't have the same appreciation for the speedy service system that Ray did, and they began experimenting with new products, procedures, and higher prices. It was impossible to enforce quality control, not to mention keep any consistency between one McDonald's and the next. Seeing this initial failure, Ray decided it was best to start expanding closer to home. But they learned a few key lessons that would shape McDonald's fundamentally. Firstly, they learned the importance of setting a minimum standard of quality in the system. They would allow operators to experiment, but they could never sacrifice three fundamental pillars, quality, service, and cleanliness. Second, they learned that the best type of operators from McDonald's were the young, hungry entrepreneur types. One of the best operators was a young Jewish man who tried selling a Catholic Bible to Ray. He found it admirable and made him an operator. These sorts of franchisees were better because they were active operators with a lot of drive and hustle, not just owners who wanted a passive income. Finally, Ray learned that if they were going to make serious money, it was not going to be from a 1.4% service fee. The average McDonald's made around $250,000 each year, but that meant McDonald's System Incorporated only made about $3,500 per store every year. They would soon have to find a better way to monetize. But for now, all of this experience did give Ray and Harry the confidence they needed to start a mass expansion of McDonald's in its second year. However, with only 18 restaurants at this point, McDonald's was still only one small fish in a massive ocean of competitors, and the fight to become the next big national chain was going to be brutal. By 1956, McDonald's was already facing a number of worthy competitors, partially because of the McDonald brothers. They'd revolutionized fast food eight years ago, but they'd welcomed others into their kitchen, creating lots of competitors who copied their system. Fast food was no longer unique to McDonald's. Ray was trying to open up new McDonald's locations across the country, but at the exact same time, so were similar franchises like In-N-Out Burger, Burger Chef, and Burger King. Even outside of burgers, Colonel Sanders was already expanding Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Carl's Jr. was doing the same with Hot dogs. With so many fast food franchises fighting for dominance, McDonald's was far from being a guaranteed success. So how did McDonald's manage to outcompete every single one of them? The answer, it turns out, was the genius of how Ray and Harry structured their franchising empire. At the time, the most common way to franchise a brick and mortar business was territorial franchising, which means selling the exclusive right to operate in a given territory. By selling huge contracts for whole areas, franchisers would make a lot of money up front before their first store ever opened, and it meant they weren't dependent on their restaurant actually succeeding to make a profit. This sounds good in theory, but in practice, it meant the interests of the franchisor and the franchisee weren't fully aligned. Instead of doing this, Ray decided to build McDonald's one store at a time. If an operator wanted to manage an additional store, they would need to prove that their first McDonald's was successful. This was slower, but it guaranteed superior quality of every store in the long run. Not just that, but traditional franchisers made most of their money by selling supplies to their franchisees. Things like kitchen equipment, cooking supplies, and even things like the restaurant side. Franchisers made quick profits by overpricing their supplies, and so they became more focused on selling stuff to their franchisees than actually becoming a successful retailer. Ray 
decided against selling supplies to his franchisees because it turned them into his customers instead of his partners. Since Ray's company only made money from its 1.4% service fee based on how much revenue each store made, it was in his best interest to make his franchisees as rich as he possibly could. It was a simple yet bold strategy, and it meant that McDonald's system incorporated its interests were fully aligned with the interests of its store operators. Both of them were trying to make McDonald's stores the best and most profitable they could be, as opposed to many other chains where the franchises just make all their money selling to franchisees. Even in person, Ray treated McDonald's operators as equal partners in his mission. Both franchisor and franchisee benefited from the success of the system as a whole, and so everyone worked to make McDonald's a success. It didn't hurt that Ray was also a very convincing salesman when it came to communicating his unshakable belief in McDonald's's future, so many franchisees fully bought into his vision. But because Ray was essentially selling a system, he needed to find the right person to help perfect it. Luckily, Ray already knew the man for the job, a young guy named Fred Turner. When Ray had first met Fred, he was just 23 years old and had been hired to flip burgers in one of their McDonald's stores. But from day one, Ray saw his own energy and enthusiasm for McDonald's reflected in Fred. He was a natural leader with an incredible work ethic, so he quickly climbed the ranks at McDonald's and within a few years, Ray named him Vice President of Operations. Just like Ray, Fred was very detail oriented. In his new role, Fred was responsible for maximizing the efficiency of every procedure in the speedy service system. And before long, Fred had basically turned every McDonald's restaurant into a small factory. They took the already successful speedy service system that the McDonald's brothers had made, and made it even better and more efficient. Of course, changing the system went completely against Ray's contract with the McDonald's brothers. But by this point, he was used to getting ignored by them. The McDonald's brothers didn't seem to like how quickly Ray was moving with everything. And so Ray often just pushed on without them. Thanks to Ray's franchising plan of treating franchisees as his partners and not customers, and thanks to Fred's innovations, the franchisees were getting incredibly rich with their stores. Through sheer word of mouth, McDonald's started earning its fame. More and more people were hearing about this exciting business opportunity to own and operate your own McDonald's. And so instead of Ray having to look for ambitious entrepreneurs to run their stores, they were now coming to him. The McFamily, as Ray called it, was growing. But as McDonald's system incorporated grew, so did its operating costs. And they still hadn't yet found a better way to make money. The McDonald brothers refused to change anything in the contract. So Ray and Harry were barely hanging on with their 1.4% service fee. Ray understood you could only get loyalty from your team if you gave it first. So he sacrificed his salary to be able to afford paying his growing number of employees. For his first eight years, Ray didn't collect a single penny. The only reason he could support his wife and daughter was because by 1959, his old sales company was still running, basically on autopilot. Ray was working 80 hour weeks with unrivaled passion at an age where most people were thinking about retirement. But but he still had two problems to solve. Firstly, his company needed to find a new way to make money, or they could never grow to a sustainable scale. And secondly, there were the McDonald brothers. Ray felt they were a huge pain to deal with, and he resented that he was doing all of this work, but seeing very little reward himself. But ultimately, the McDonald's brand still technically belonged to them. Of course, Ray was keen to change that, and in doing so, it would bring out the very worst of Ray Kroc. Ray was building a growing number of McDonald's across America, but whilst his operators were getting rich, his company still hadn't found a way to make a profit. The McDonald's brother's lawyer, who Ray called his mortal enemy, always advised them to never sign anything Ray asked for. So they insisted on the 1.4% service fee that had been agreed in the original contract, which made it impossible for Ray to make any real profit without a creative solution. Thankfully, Ray had his financial wizard, Harry. Harry came up with an idea to create Franchise Realty Corporation, a separate company from McDonald's System Incorporated. At first, Ray was a little confused why Harry was suggesting they get into real estate, but it soon became clear it could be the solution to all their problems. Up until this point, McDonald's store operators would pay rent to whoever owned the land beneath their store, but now Ray's new company, Franchise Realty, would buy the property and lease it out to the McDonald's store operators. This put Ray and Harry in a powerful position for a few reasons. Firstly, it gave them a degree of freedom from the McDonald's brothers. As a separate company, Franchise Realty wasn't subject to the original contract Ray had signed with them. Second, it gave Ray and Harry more control over their franchisees. They could enforce quality standards as conditions in their lease agreement. For example, if an operator was not keeping their store clean, Franchise Realty had the right to terminate the lease on their property. Thirdly, owning the land finally gave Ray and Harry a way to make some 
some decent money. Instead of rent, the store operator would pay a flat monthly fee or 8.5% of the store's revenue, whichever was higher. Add to that the 1.4% service fee they were already getting, and you have some serious cash flow. Finally, Franchise Realty asked for a security deposit from its operators to build the store, and they could use that money as a down payment on the land without spending a dime of their own. This gave Franchise Realty assets on its balance sheet, something that was immensely helpful when negotiating with banks and getting access to more funds for expansion. It was a brilliant plan. But the real beauty of it was how it once again aligned the interests of McDonald's with its franchisees. Whilst 8.5% of your revenue go into franchise realty sounds like a lot, in reality it just meant that Ray had yet another reason to ensure their franchisees became extremely rich. The more money an operator made, the more money Ray and his companies made. Now that they had a winning formula thanks to getting into the real estate business, Ray and Harry could sense that they were on the brink of something extraordinary with McDonald's. By 1960, McDonald's had 228 restaurants in operation, and slowly but surely, they were buying up all the land beneath them. However, it was also around that time that Ray was introduced to Joan Smith, who happened to be the wife of a McDonald's franchisee. Ray met her when she was the pianist at a restaurant, and they had an instant connection and ended up playing the piano and singing together. Unlike Ray's wife Ethel, Joan shared his passion for business, and they talked at length about what McDonald's could become. After spending more time with her, Ray very quickly fell in love with her, and before long he filed for divorce with Ethel and proposed to Joan instead. Joan had fallen for Ray as well, but she was married with a family at the time, so she told him she'd have to think about it. While she did, Ray set out to do something he'd wanted to do for quite a while. He needed to finally get rid of the McDonald brothers. There are two sides to this story. There's the official story, and a much darker one told by the McDonald brothers. You see, by improving on the speedy service system without their written permission, Ray had violated his contract with the brothers more times than he cared to count, and this meant they could technically sue him at any time. They were always unpredictable when it came to legal matters, and so Ray decided to act before they had chance to ruin his plans. He called them up and declared that he wanted to buy them out of McDonald's completely. Ray told them to name their price and call him when they knew. A few days later, the phone rang. But when Ray heard the number, his jaw dropped to the floor. $2.7 million. That gives a million for me, a million for Mac, and 700,000 for Uncle Sam. Ray thought about it for a while. This was everything he wanted. He'd get the McDonald's name, the original store in San Bernardino, and the rights to everything McDonald's related, so he'd be fully in charge. But he had no idea where to get $2.7 million. Sure, things have been going well for Ray with this new real estate strategy, but $2.7 million in 1960 is roughly the equivalent of $28 million today. Even for an up-and-coming business, that's a lot of money. But Ray knew this was his chance, so he agreed to the deal. Thankfully, Harry had some powerful contacts on Wall Street, so Ray was able to borrow the cash. It meant taking on a lot of debt, but Ray was so confident in the future of McDonald's, he felt certain he'd make it back. However, the brothers suddenly decided that they didn't want to give up their own McDonald's store, but they still insisted Ray paid the same price. Ray was furious, and it looked like the whole deal may fall apart. But eventually, it was agreed that the brothers would keep their store as long as they renamed their restaurant to the Big M, so it was technically not associated with the McDonald's brand. By now, Ray hated the brothers with a passion, but at least it seemed the deal was done. But here is where the story splits in two paths. The official story is that the deal went well, and the McDonald brothers were soon showing off their million dollar check to their friends and family. However, Richard McDonald tells a different story. According to him, a key part of the deal was that the brothers wanted to keep the 0.5% royalty they'd received all this time. But Ray claimed that if this was written into the contract, insurance companies would charge him too much. So Ray supposedly agreed to pay the royalty out of his own income, but that the deal would have to be done on a handshake basis rather than being official. The brothers were nervous to take Ray at his word, but they reluctantly agreed, trusting that he wouldn't screw them over. But Richard McDonald claims that when it came time for Ray to pay up the royalties the brothers were owed, he refused, never paying them a single penny. Given how successful McDonald's went on to become, that 0.5% of all revenue would have been worth billions of dollars. However, since the agreement wasn't on paper, there was nothing the brothers could do, and they could never prove that the deal ever happened this way. Now, it's entirely possible that Ray did make this handshake deal and then just completely backstabbed them, knowing they could never prove it. But many who have looked into the story of McDonald's believe that Richard's story is nothing but a myth. Either way, a few things are certain. Seven years of arguing with the McDonald brothers had cemented Ray's hatred for them, and he definitely did want revenge. As soon as Richard and Max signed that piece of paper to transfer all ownership of McDonald's to Ray, he told one of his employees, I'm normally not a vindictive man. 
but this time, I'm gonna get those sons of bitches. Ray's first order of business after negotiating the buyout was to open a McDonald's store a block away from the store owned by the brothers, which they'd had to rename to the Big M. Ray's intention for opening that store was purely to run them out of business. It was cruel. They weren't doing any harm by keeping their single store as a passion project, but it worked. The Big M couldn't compete with a McDonald's right next to it, and so the brothers' dream of wanting to keep their store was shattered. Ray also went about rewriting history. By this point, Ray and Harry had consolidated McDonald's System Incorporated and Franchise Realty Corporation into a single entity, the McDonald's Corporation. Ray called himself the founder of McDonald's and advertised his first franchise in Illinois as McDonald's Number no. 1, essentially erasing the McDonald brothers and their original store from the company's history. With the brothers out of the way, Ray then got the call he'd been waiting for. It was Joan, the woman he'd left his wife for, but she didn't sound excited. Joan said her mother was disappointed that she was even considering leaving her husband, and Joan's daughter told her that if she got a divorce, she could forget that she even had a daughter. As a result, Joan told Ray she couldn't marry him. Ray put the phone down and sat in silence, staring blankly at the floor. He'd finally got the McDonald's business to himself, but the love of his life was now gone. At that moment, Ray decided it was time to throw himself into the business even more, which meant things were about to get crazy. By 1961, the McDonald brothers were out of the way, and so there was nothing stopping Ray from transforming McDonald's into everything he dreamed it could be. Ray wanted an aggressive marketing campaign to cement McDonald's as a household name. But with only 228 stores across the country, most Americans had never even heard of McDonald's. A national advertising campaign would be overkill, so the team decided that the best way to promote McDonald's would be locally, with the help of their franchisees. It was a gamble for sure. Selecting the right franchisee to run a restaurant was hard enough, and now they were trusting them with McDonald's image. But Ray's personal preference in franchisees were the young entrepreneurial types, and this became one of McDonald's strengths, because they were always experimenting with new ideas on how to improve their own restaurants. For example, one operator wanted to use TV advertising to get children interested in his McDonald's. He found a local show called Bozo Circus, and when it came time for the Bozo character to promote McDonald's, the actor was a spectacular salesman, and the local McDonald's was soon flooded with kids. When the TV show was cancelled though, they were left without their biggest promoter. But realising how successful targeting children had been, McDonald's created a new mascot, Ronald McDonald, and they made him a staple of every single McDonald's, along with a whole cast of characters including the Hamburglar and Grimace. McDonald's would later double down on this strategy further by introducing the Happy Meal, which included a toy, and thus helped get new customers hooked on McDonald's from an early age. It was only in later years that many would come to question the ethics of so aggressively targeting children with their fast food. But still, individual McDonald's operators like this one were responsible for creating other innovations like the Big Mac, the drive through and Playlands. And that was the duality of Ray Kroc. Whilst he was very keen to ensure the same consistent quality of experience at every McDonald's, he also encouraged his franchisees to use their own creativity. McDonald's would then choose the best among these local experiments and implement them into the system as a whole, so every other restaurant would benefit too. For many companies, growing larger can often mean less innovation, but for McDonald's, every new operator came with fresh new ideas to bring to the table. So, as more stores began to market themselves across the country, eventually McDonald's did begin to get national attention. At this point, Ray figured the next logical move was taking McDonald's public on the stock market, something no other fast food company had done by 1965. And the timing was perfect. America was in the thick of one of the most generous bull markets in history, so within weeks of going public, McDonald's stock rose over 60% in value. Ray was now a multi-millionaire, as was Harry, who had been with Ray pretty much from the start. However, it wasn't all plain sailing for the McDonald's team. In the 60s, Harry's had felt McDonald's needed to slow down its aggressive expansion due to fears of an upcoming recession, but their main competitor, Burger King, did the exact opposite. In 1967, Burger King opened over 100 restaurants, and by the next year, Burger King was only 100 total restaurants away from surpassing McDonald's. Seeing that McDonald's could lose its spot at the top of the fast food industry, Ray demanded they ignore the warnings and resume the expansion campaign immediately. In truth, tensions between Ray and Harry had been starting to grow for a while. They had very different perspectives and often saw things very differently. Whilst Harry was technically the CEO, Ray was the company president and owned the majority of company stock, so he could replace Harry if he needed to. And after the expansion argument, he nearly did. But luckily it didn't come to that, as Harry stepped down from the company voluntarily and Ray took over as CEO himself. 
But one day, while giving a speech to a group of McDonald's operators, Ray saw that Joan was in the crowd, the woman who'd broken his heart years ago. Ray worked into his speech that he'd now achieved all he ever wanted in life, except one thing. The crowd was confused what he meant, but Ray was staring right at Joan as he said it. To get her close, Ray called for an after party in his suite. By the end of the night, Ray and Joan were the only ones left, singing old favourites at the piano. Joan told Ray that this time, she didn't care what anyone told her. She was getting a divorce from her husband, and wanted to marry Ray instead. Now, for 15 years, Ray's entire life had been consumed by McDonald's, and it had paid off. But now that he was starting a new marriage with the woman he'd been chasing for years, he wanted to finally think a bit less about the business. For a man as driven as Ray, this certainly didn't mean he would retire. It just meant he would only think about McDonald's while he slept, and up to about 5pm, and then keep the evenings reserved for Joan. Whilst Ray would remain the public face of McDonald's for many years, he wanted to name a new driven CEO to lead the company forward. And that responsibility fell to Fred Turner, the young fry cook Ray had picked out and promoted to Vice President of Operations all those years ago. He'd become like the son Ray never had, and after shadowing Ray for years, Ray felt Fred was ready to take over as CEO. And whilst Ray had left big shoes to fill, it's fair to say Fred delivered. The first challenge Fred took on was expanding McDonald's globally. None of their competitors had been able to succeed outside of America yet, and even Ray had tried to expand McDonald's into the Netherlands, Canada, and the Caribbean. However, their original mistake was trying to adapt their menu to the local culture, and it failed horribly. When Fred tried breaking McDonald's into Japan, he knew he had to take a different approach. Instead of changing the menu, he left it intact. But like in America, he left marketing to the locals. And it worked. The Japanese people loved the authentic McDonald's experience. In fact, they admired its Japan-like efficiency. The same strategy worked in other countries as well, and McDonald's became one of the main exporters of American culture. Since they recruited locals to operate the restaurants and market the brand, the world received them with open arms. Next on Fred's list was putting expansion into high gear. Fred had climbed the ladder at McDonald's all the way from Burger Flipper to CEO, so he understood the business from all angles. When he was younger, he perfected every aspect of operations, from finding the right temperature to cook fries in, to the way employees spoke to customers. Now though, Fred was optimising the process of finding a franchisee and opening a new store. And it's fair to say he succeeded. With Fred as CEO, there was no escaping McDonald's. New stores were being built across the world faster than even Ray had ever dreamed was possible. By 1974, they were opening more than 500 restaurants every year, and the number only kept growing. Only a few years before, Burger King had equaled McDonald's in terms of yearly growth, Fred broke McDonald's into the global market and more than tripled the number of stores. Burger King was left far behind, and McDonald's was fast becoming one of the largest and most iconic companies in the world. However, now that McDonald's was a global conglomerate, it was up against a new and dangerous caliber of challenges. As the international face of fast food, McDonald's was about to face some of the worst scandals in its history. Because of its enormous size, McDonald's became a target for public humiliations and much, much worse. McDonald's began running a competition where Monopoly stickers were attached to many of its products. If you found the right stickers, you would win prizes. Most of these were simple items like a free Big Mac or soda, but there were also a smaller amount of high value prizes you could win like cars, vacations, or even the grand prize of a million dollars. It was a fun lottery that definitely helped increase sales at McDonald's. But it just so happened that a former policeman and a member of an Italian crime family managed to rig the entire game and steal millions of dollars. You see, McDonald's had hired an impartial third-party company to manage the promotion, so that McDonald's themselves would not have any control over who actually won the prizes. The chief of security for this third-party company was a former cop called Jerome Jacobson, who was responsible for distributing the winning stickers to stores across America. When Jerome was transporting the winning stickers, they were already in an envelope with a tamper-proof seal, and he was accompanied by a chaperone, so in theory, there was no way he could steal them. However, due to a mistake with their supplier, one day Jerome received some of these tamper-proof seals to his personal address instead of the company address. Jerome realised that he could essentially open the sealed envelope containing the winning stickers, switch them for different low-value stickers, then reseal the envelope using these tamper-proof seals he'd received, thus leaving no evidence behind that he'd just stolen the winning pieces. He simply had to go to the bathroom so that the chaperone with him couldn't see what he was doing, then make the swap over there, and come out as if nothing had happened. Now of course, even though he was able to steal the stickers, Jerome couldn't just redeem the winning stickers himself. That would be extremely obvious he'd stolen them. 
So, he started selling them to people he knew. For example, he sold one winning sticker to his brother-in-law and another to his local butcher. In exchange, they gave him a cut of the prize money once they'd redeemed it at the McDonald's store where Jerome was supposed to have delivered it. Jerome made some good money from this. However, the operation went to a whole new level when Jerome met an Italian mobster called Jerry Colombo. Jerome and Jerry struck up a partnership, where Jerry would sell the tickets to his connections in the Colombo crime family and their associates. So Jerome began stealing more and more winning McDonald's Monopoly stickers, gave them to Jerry, who would then sell them off to his network. And for years, McDonald's and the general public were completely unaware that millions of dollars of prizes were in fact going to organized criminals. For Jerome, everything was going perfectly, up until Jerry Colombo died in a car accident. With his main partner in crime now gone, Jerome cut ties with the Colombo family, and many suspect this was ultimately Jerome's undoing. You see, in the year 2000, the FBI got an anonymous tip to look into the McDonald's Monopoly Prize winners. When they did, the FBI noticed that some of the winners were related. They didn't have the same surname, but it was still a very odd coincidence. So they dug deeper, and found that even though the prizes had been claimed all across the US, the majority of winners seemed to be actually living in Jacksonville. Clearly something was going on. There were millions of dollars at stake here. So the FBI contacted the heads of McDonald's, who wanted to stop the game immediately when they heard the news. But instead, the FBI convinced them to run the promotion one final time so they could do an undercover operation. And thus, when the next million dollar winner claimed his reward, a man named Michael Hoover, the FBI approached him pretending to be a film crew and asked him some questions about which store he'd got the winning sticker from. Of course, he hadn't actually got the sticker from a McDonald's store. He'd got it from Jerome. But right after the undercover agents left, Michael made a phone call in which he mentioned Jerome's name and literally said they bought it. All of it. So he was bragging about how his lies had worked. Completely unaware, he hadn't really spoken to a film crew, but instead undercover FBI agents who had wiretapped him and were now hearing everything he was confessing over the phone. The FBI now had concrete evidence and they swooped in. In total, 50 people were convicted in association with this scam, with the main leader Jerome pleading guilty and having to pay back all the millions of dollars he'd stolen, along with a three year jail sentence. However, Jerome had run this scam from 1988 to 2001, and by the time they were caught by the FBI, McDonald's had already paid out $24 million to illegitimate winners. Not just that, because the big prizes had been paid out to scammers, real McDonald's customers had missed out on the prizes. So McDonald's gave away around $25 million to random customers to try and make up for this. They also paid $16.6 .6 in illegal settlements. In total, the scammers cost McDonald's over $65 million. But the real losers were all the customers who'd been participating in the contest hoping to win prizes, unaware they couldn't possibly win them, as most of the big prizes were being illegally given to the mafia and their connections. This fraud was undoubtedly a huge controversy for McDonald's. However, just a couple of years later, the company would be involved in an even bigger scandal. In 2004, Morgan Spurlock released his documentary Super Size Me. At the time, several people were suing McDonald's, claiming their food made them overweight and caused them health problems. But none of them could prove McDonald's was really to blame, as they obviously ate food other than McDonald's as well. When Morgan learned about these cases, he challenged himself to eat only McDonald's every day for a month. That meant breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and if an employee offered to supersize his meal, he'd take the largest possible option from the menu. Morgan knew eating only McDonald's would have some strange effects on him, but he underestimated the challenge's true health risks. Today, there's a widespread understanding that eating fast food can be detrimental to your health. Fast food usually contains lots of sugar, saturated fats, and preservatives, so most health professionals agree that it's better to avoid fast food. Not surprisingly, Morgan's one month McDonald's binge worried his doctors. By the end of 30 days, Morgan put on 27 pounds, his cholesterol and blood pressure were through the roof, and he felt depressed for a good portion of the challenge. There were scenes of him vomiting after eating a full super size option meal, and he even developed serious heart complications, all within the span of a month. After the documentary aired, the public image of McDonald's was never the same. Six weeks after the documentary was released, McDonald's removed the super size option from the menu. They even started the Go Active campaign, which promoted healthier options and exercise. McDonald's claimed these decisions were not influenced by the documentary, but the damage was already done. Super Size Me portrayed McDonald's as junk food, and the reputation stuck to them. And it is interesting to look at the data here. In the 1960s, when McDonald's had merely 228 restaurants, America's obesity rate stood at just 
just 13%. Whereas today, more than 40% of Americans are obese, over three times what it was 60 years ago. And many correlate the rise of fast food chains like McDonald's with the global trend towards obesity. Now, of course, it's important to note that this is influenced by a wide range of factors, and fast food is only one of many contributing elements. And ultimately, consumers choose what they eat. But there's no doubt that as the largest fast food chain in the world, and the one who perfected it, the story of fast food is closely tied with the story of McDonald's. But that certainly hasn't stopped McDonald's success. With a market cap of over $200 billion today, it's one of the 50 largest companies on the planet. What's interesting though, is that every year, the company has its annual Founders Day event, a celebration to honor Ray Kroc. Not the McDonald's brothers who really started the company. But whilst they were the true founders, it's also true that the business would never have been as big as it is without Ray Kroc. It was Ray who constantly wanted to keep expanding whilst the brothers wanted an easier, more relaxed life. 